when it comes to the phenomenon that, for better or worse, historically has been referred to as Gnosticism, one of the biggest puzzles is why this tradition so specifically identifies the god of Judaism as the demiurge and characterizes that figure as malevolent and or incompetent. Jews would have reason not to characterize the creator god in this way, while non-Jews would have very little reason to focus specifically on this figure from Judaism. If we can solve this puzzle, it has the potential not only to help us understand the distinctive Gnostic solution to the problem of evil, the focus of this conference, but also how and why Gnosticism itself originated. This paper explores the possibility that the monotheistic revolution in ancient Israel, which ultimately creates the philosophical problem of evil as we know it today, gives rise to Gnosticism as a response to that same innovation. Mandayan sources, often neglected as representatives of Gnostic literature, offer unique data that may help us find more satisfying and persuasive answers to these questions. Gnostics share similar approaches to dealing with the practical reality of evil, of malevolent forces in the world across traditions. And they share the, a lot of these things in common with other traditions as well. Ritual immersion, baptism, incantation bowls. What's distinctive of Gnosticism is this theoretical solution to the problem of evil by identifying the creator as aligned with those hostile spiritual forces that Gnostics and others sought to protect themselves against. The answer I propose here in light of the direct evidence from Mandayan sources, but also inference from others, is that this configuration emerges in response to the monotheistic revolution that ultimately gives rise to the Torah and the Jewish religion in the form we later come to know them. The Torah and the associated religious teachings took much longer to be promulgated in the farthest geographic regions where Israelites could be found than in Jerusalem and Judah, and longer still to come to predominate and or to be accepted as normative by the majority in such communities. The development and formulation of monotheism, one may call it that at its earliest stage, became a characteristic feature that distinguishes Judaism and its offshoots. It is a development that makes the problem of evil a theological conundrum in a way that it is not for other traditions and had not been in Israel prior to this point, since the blame for all that happens must be ascribed to the single divine entity. The case I will make here is that Gnosticism represents a response to both the proposal of monotheism itself and the implications in terms of the problem of evil. Gnostic texts from Nag Hammadi mock the demiurge as ignorant for seeing precisely what Deuteronomy Isaiah attributes to Yahweh in material that some would say represents the high watermark of the monotheistic trajectory within the Jewish scriptures. I am God, and there is no other. This is found in the Apocryphon of John, Hypostasis of the Archons, and on the origin of the world. Puzzlingly, we find this negative view of the Jewish Supreme God combined with a deep interest in that figure, Jewish scriptures, and other elements of Jewish tradition, including particular focus on the antediluvian patriarchs. If we ask who might combine these features as part of their worldview and literature, an answer presents itself those Israelites who objected to the Deuteronomistic revolution that imposed worship of one God alone. If we map the major locations associated with Gnosticism and the far reaches of the Israelite diaspora in this period, we find a close match with focal points in Egypt and Mesopotamia and drawing together uh, closer and closer to the central focal point in Jerusalem with locations like Samaria and Transjordan also deserving a mention. I would like to bring to the center of attention the theme of this conference, the problem of evil and the nature of evil. As we've already noted, the formulation of Judaism's monotheistic theology in this period created the problem of evil by making it more difficult to blame illness, disaster, and other forms of suffering on conflict among competing divine powers. It did this at a time when the Jewish people could least afford to do so. The rebuilding of Jerusalem and of the temple turned out to be a disappointment. A few centuries later, those who determined themselves to obey the Jewish Torah were persecuted for doing so by the Syrian ruler Antiochus IV. Within monotheism, who but the one God could ultimately be responsible for this? Perhaps that God is not indeed as powerful or as just as is claimed. Monotheism creates the problem of evil as more than an abstract puzzle, turning it into an existential crisis of faith. Judaism formulated this framework and then witnessed those who were supposedly most faithful to the one God being singled out for torment and execution. Would it be any surprise if this too caused some either to revive or embrace for the first time older views that had made better sense of this experience? 
perhaps more definitively turning them in the direction in which the supposed one God responsible for making all this was judged to be neither as powerful nor as good as the relatively recently imposed new orthodoxy insisted. Even if that context did not contribute directly to the emergence of Gnosticism, Gnosticism may nonetheless be understood as at its deepest level, a solution to the problem of evil and a relatively straightforward one. In essence, it inverts the situation posed in most monotheistic systems, rather than there being one supreme good creator whose good creation is marred by rebels, both angelic and human, there is an inept and malevolent creator whose material world is interfered with by greater forces from outside that did not wish that material creation to come into existence, but respond with compassion nonetheless and seek to redeem those fragments of light and divinity trapped therein. Much of what I'm proposing in this paper could be surmised even in the absence of the Mendian evidence. However, Mendian texts offer concrete evidence which, while not by any means con constituting proof, makes this scenario sufficiently plausible that it may be worth accepting as a theory of Gnostic origins for so long as a better alternative does not present itself. Let us now turn our attention to those details, and in particular, the figures in the Mandayan light world, whose names at the very least may say, be said to fit naturally into our proposed scenario, but in my view, seem to cry out for an explanation in terms of such a framework. The first great light is the divine source uh, and supreme source of all, and the second great life bears the name Yoshimen. Conrad Kessler and Ethel Drower have proposed, and other scholars, including those working in linguistics, have confirmed that Yashamim is likely derived from Yah Shamim, or Yah Shamayim, Yah of heaven. This might in turn be related to, um, and is at the very least analogous with, the more familiar divine epithet, Baal Shamem. Were this the only such name to be found among light world beings in Mennonite sources, the etymology might be considered suspect or uncertain, and its significance would be far less clear. However, there are many names whose derivation is of a similar sort. Yukobar stems from Yah is great, and I might add is a more positive figure than Yoshman, who's quite a troublemaker in the light world. There's a close parallel once again to Yukobar in the name Baal Kabar. There's also a figure that uh, Drower categorizes a genie called Yusmir. Smir, like its uh, Hebrew cognate, denotes kept or safeguarded in Mandaic. Yuzatak is an epithet for Mandadhe, knowledge of life, the key savior figure, uh, and might derive from uh, Yah's righteous. And perhaps most significantly and interestingly, Yurba derives from Yah the Great and is also called Adonai, who is also identified with the sun, Shamesh and who is the chief malevolent world ruler, along with Ruhad Kudsha, Holy Spirit, and her offspring, the seven planets and the 12 signs of the zodiac. Ruha, in turn, is identified with Libat, Venus, and that figure is also called Stira, that is Ishtar, or Astarte. All of these names are familiar from Israelite tradition or can be related to it, but in some instances, only in the form that Israelite religion had prior to the monotheistic revolution and the Babylonian exile. Returning to the original emanations, the names continue to be significant. The third great life is Abatur, an interesting name in itself, who has among his secret names Torel, which perhaps derives from Bull El. Bull is a common epithet of El in Ugaritic literature, sometimes using precisely this combination of words, Tor, Il. The fourth great life is called Tahil, uh, and that figure is sometimes called Gabriel. While the name Tahil is quite distinctive of the Mendayan tradition, it's recognizable as deriving from Ta plus El. And while uh, the, those connections in themselves are interesting, it has to be pointed out that Ta and El were identified in Canaan during the era of Egyptian rule there. Mention should be made here of Anat Hay, about whom Quispel wrote, Hay, life, being a designation of God in the Mendayan religion, we may safely assume that she is none other than Anat Yahu. That latter name should be familiar to those who know the Elephantine papyri, but even if one does not treat life as directly substituted for the divine name Yah in this instance, and treats this as simply one more example of the Mandayan penchant for giving what we might call hyphenated double names to light world beings, her name is still recognizable as Anat. In view of all this evidence, it seems appropriate to propose a direct connection between traditional Israelite religion prior to the exile and Mandaism. 
We should also ask why scholars such as Quispel, who paid more attention to these elements in Mandayan and other Gnostic texts than others did, did not propose what we're proposing and make this central to and the matrix for an explanation for the development and the origin of Gnosticism itself. While we can only speculate, one factor is probably Quispel's view, or rather his acceptance of the widely held presupposition that these elements represented in ancient Israel syncretism, accretions and borrowings from supposedly foreign Canaanite culture. As a result of that earlier framework that scholars such as Quispel brought to the relevant evidence, they did not see in the preservation of these ancient traditions a reaction against Deuteronomistic reforms and did not see in them, in turn, a spark that might have launched Gnosticism on its course. Now that the mainstream of scholarship has moved beyond the categorization of elements such as the goddess Anath uh, or Asherah as syncretistic borrowings from Canaanite religion, recognizing them instead as native expressions of Israelite religion, which is itself an example of Canaanite culture, we may take this evidence and reinterpret it within that framework. There's a particular appropriateness, I think, about doing so under the auspices of the Enoch Seminar, since the project of situating Christianity as just one example of early Judaism, and that of situating Israelite religion as one example of Canaanite religion, have some natural resonances with one another. Returning to our main argument, the presence of pre-exilic Israelite deity names in texts that also denigrate Adonai, not only cries out for explanation, but seems to call for an explanation in terms of rejection of the imposition of monolatrous or monotheistic norms within an Israelite context. The most puzzling feature of Gnosticism, its focus on Jewish scripture, combined with rejection of that scripture's central emphasis, not only ceases to be a puzzle, but makes perfect sense when situated against that historical backdrop. The Mandayan evidence points to such an origin, but our scenario can be applied to the phenomenon of Gnosticism as a whole, even if some of the evidence is less clearly visible in texts and traditions expressed in, and perhaps adapted to, Greek and Coptic linguistic contexts. Even there, the connections between wisdom, Sophia, and the Israelite goddess have been noted. Bringing Mandayan sources as well as those from Nag Hammadi into the picture together allows us to recognize the focus on the creator god of the Jewish scriptures as a feature spanning the full geographic extent of the phenomenon of Gnosticism as we know it, such that it becomes implausible to view these things as an accretion to that tradition from the outside, picked up along the way in some places but not in others. Identifying these elements as central to Gnosticism's core rather than add-ons makes a significant difference, leading us to a robust framework for explaining Gnostic origins. Some Israelites persisted in maintaining their traditions, eventually, if not at first, doing so secretly in order to avoid conflict with the increasingly dominant perspective that viewed their beliefs as abhorrent in light of Torah. Within this context, they would have developed alternative ways of understanding the scriptures that were now promoted and read in their community. In this context, we can envisage the emergence of the outlook, not only of Mandayan sources, but also of works such as the Apocryphon of John, with its deep concern with Genesis, and yet at the same time, its insistence that it is not as Moses said. If I'm correct, then the innovation in Gnosticism was not the distinction between the Supreme God and the Creator. That becomes instead a conservative element. They held to an opposition to the innovation of identifying the two. In response to and protest against that identification, they denigrated the creator's hubris at claiming to be the only deity, turning him into a more malevolent figure in the process. If we ask why this solution to the question of Gnostic origins has not been formulated and proposed previously, I believe that the overall lack of attention to Mandayan sources is the principal reason, especially coupled with the tendency to view pre-exilic Israelite polytheism as syncretism and the imposition of monotheism as reform rather than revolution. Hopefully, even if you have not, or at least not yet, found my case for my conclusion about Gnostic origins persuasive, you will at the very least have become persuaded of the importance of Mandayan literature, its richness, and its fascinating distinctiveness as part of the broader tradition that, for better or worse, has traditionally been labeled and sometimes still continues to be labeled Gnosticism. Thank you. <laughs>